Hi, welcome to the National Grid's Choice Online News, and today we have a very special guest, uh, a senior pastor all the way from Ukraine. He is none other than uh, Pastor Sunday uh, Arde Lodja, and he is a founder uh, and a senior pastor for the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God uh, for all nations in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, pastor Sunday, welcome to my show. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you for welcoming me. You're most welcome. You know, it is amazing uh, that you have built a, a church in Ukraine, uh, and it's such a it's such a wonderful uh, news to know that uh, it has grown to a, a quite a substantial uh, membership. Uh, could you give us some update today? Uh, what's the membership today in your church in Ukraine? Uh, well, we're well over twenty five thousand people in Ukraine. Amazing, uh, uh, and so one of the uh, things that people like to know right now, you've written a book called church shift and you know it's been around for uh, several years right now and at the same time there's going to be a new release uh, of the mass market paperback by charisma media uh, charisma house as well and so next year all of you for those who are wanting to know uh, please place you can place your order right now or you can place an order on amazon.com uh, church shift by pastor sunday uh, pastor sunday can you tell us a little bit more about why uh, you were inspired to write this wonderful book, uh, you know, Church Shift. Yes, in 2007, I began to travel, 2006, 2007, I began to travel to the United States more often. And uh, as I traveled, I, I had a kind of idealistic um, expectations of the churches in America because I grew up in Africa myself, and I'd been hearing about America, but I'd not been there quite often. So I thought of the churches in America as the most progressive churches in the world, and I thought that the gospel of the kingdom is well known to the American church, and I thought that the American, is actu the American church is actually influencing and shaping the, the, the face of Christianity over the all over the world, and also influencing the social political scenario back in their country in America. But when I got to America, I was so flabbergasted and um, surprised, amazed, totally, you no, know, shocked by the reality of things that I that I saw on the ground. Uh, looking, go, traveling from one church to the other, I not, I noticed that. The churches in America are mainly inward focused. There are churches that are mainly what I call the church-minded churches. There are churches that are mainly uh, focused on um, the local church rather than focusing on the kingdom of God. So what I saw is that a church is more concerned about the growth of the local church the budget of the local church and the you no know, properties that the local church has instead of the church concerning itself prim primarily with, by or with uh, you know bringing the influence of the values of the kingdom of god to the larger society i feel that the great commission is about bringing and imposing the reality and the values of the kingdom of God upon the larger society rather than just sitting in a local church. So that was what uh, prompted me to try to write this book and share my experience with the church in America. Maybe that could help the church worldwide. Now, it, it is uh, said here uh, on, your inf on your church information, you have started your church uh, in just 12 years. You built the largest evangelical uh, church in Europe. And with a cross-cultural ministry with more than 2 million converts and 600 church plants uh, worldwide. How do you do that? Well, it's amazing. Uh, one of the uh, principles behind that is that, number one, we don't bring, we don't, I don't build a church to contain members or for membership. Uh, my philosophy is that I reach out to the people bring them into the local church and equip them and send them back to the 
field or to the to the to the to the larger society. So the goal is not consummating members or membership is not condensing people in the uh, local church, but my greatest passion has always been releasing people from the local church. So my primary objective is to equip each person that comes to my church to become a leader that will eventually take responsibility for a sphere or a segment of the society to impose and bring the kingdom of God over there so that the influence of the kingdom, the values of the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom will begin to operate in all the spheres of the society in any given country. Now, Pastor Sande, we have a question from Indonesia. Uh, a pastor from a church over there has, a, has, this, has this question for you. Uh, dear Pastor Sande, uh, you start your church in Ukraine. Why Ukraine? And yeah. how and how and how did you uh, first start uh, a a church in Ukraine from from just a handful of people to one of the largest churches today? Well, that is uh, one of the major miracles in the 21st century church. Uh, in the church of the 20, in the modern day church, it's very very hard to come across uh, a miracle like that because it's really a miracle. Um, I left my native Nigeria when I was 19 years old and um, went to Russia, which was uh, a communist country at that time, before Ukraine became an independent country. So I actually left Africa to study uh, journalism in, um, in Russia. So after my, completing my journalism in Belarus, the city of Minsk, I came over to Ukraine to still work as a journalist at the uh, television station. But all the while, I was a Christian because I became saved just six months before I went to Russia to study. So uh, come, having come over to Ukraine, I be, the Lord began to deal with me that uh, the mission that he had for me and the reason why he took me from Africa in the first place was not to just do to just make money or to work as a journalist. But it was actually because of uh, the kingdom, just to take to begin to do the uh, work of the ministry. So I began to have learned the language as a student, so I could speak the language, I could communicate, but uh, I also needed to uh, be able to reach out to the people, which was very difficult because in this part of the world, people kind of look down on... Uh, and non-white, non-European people. And I'm not European, I'm African, I'm Nigerian. And some people tend to uh, commonize uh, and uh, categorize all Nigerians to be crooks and things like that. So I had a lot of challenges before me. And um, so, but you know, when you have a big God and you have faith in that big God, I began to step out by faith, time to begin to, I began to uh, um, go by, go less by what I saw, by the obstacles that I saw in the physical, and to rely more on um, on the um, on the, the the super and the unlimited forces of God that are in me. So I uh, stepped out, started believing God, and st God started giving me concrete directions on how to build this church. And uh, some of those things that God spoke to me about are written uh, in the book Church Shift. And, you know, a, a, a great strategy that any church could implement in any country. Now, I, we have another question from Myanmar. And uh, a pastor there would like to ask this question. Uh, dear Pastor Sunday, uh, what is your biggest miracle that you had encountered when you first started uh, your church? Uh, and how do you see yourself uh, as a African uh, making a difference? You know, uh, moving forward, uh, what what is, what does it mean to be a African in Ukraine? Because you have faced uh, racial uh, you know challenges. How did you overcome that? Yes, I think that probably might be the biggest miracle that I've experienced that I'm probably the only black man you know, in the church that, I mean, in the world that is leading a congregation that is um, largely white Caucasians of, 
99.9 percent .9 of our church is white. Only myself, <clears throat> myself, my wife, and a few other people are black in this church. But when you lead a church of 20,000, 25,000 people, and you, uh, you, you know, less than a hundred people are black, uh, you're not basically 99 percent white congregation. So I think that would be the biggest miracle. Of course, we've seen several other miracles. We've seen deliverances, people getting set free from drug addiction. And that is another major miracle that God has done, that God does regularly in this church, because we have over 10,000 people that have been set free from drug addictions, 10,000 from drugs, from alcohol. And uh, we've seen people raised from the dead in this church. Uh, we've seen cancer healed in this church and all forms of miracles, you know, anything you could think about. Well, you spoke, speaking about raising people from the dead, uh, we have another question uh, that's coming in from, from Philippines and is also a pastor who has read your book, Church Shift, uh, some time ago. And, is, and the question is, uh, Dear Pastor Sunday, uh, I'm a pastor from Philippines uh, and I'm quite curious uh, to know what is uh, uh, your key, three key strategies in growing a new church that is challenging uh, in in your environment. Uh, is there any three key lessons that I can learn from you? Yes. Number one, stewardship. 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 Stewardship is about serving. That the key, the main key to greatness is not to become somebody yourself, but to make yourself a servant to as many people as possible. I regard myself as a ladder I see myself as a ladder up that is lying on the wall upon which people could climb and to reach the top of their aspirations and of their desires. So I use the church as a platform to raise people up. So if you would position yourself, not that people will come and serve you, that people who come to your church, they don't just come to serve your vision, but if you position yourself to help them to give them purpose, to give them vision, to help them discover themselves, their callings. And if you will serve them and help them to come to their full potential, that is one of the things that will really uh, give you the, break, the biggest breakthrough in ministry. So stewardship, make yourself the servant of all. And, um, you know, I see myself as a bridge that has been built and is helping people to pass across uh, the gulfs of their lives. That is, they could ride on me. I see myself as a bridge. And people could come in, in cars, in bicycles, in uh, lorries, in trucks, and ride over this bridge to get to their destination. So if you will lay yourself down and see yourself as a servant of all, you will sure become the, 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 the greatest of all. That's number one. Number two, relationship, relationship, relationship. Now, relationship is very important. You must learn to build relationship with people. Now, there are three forms of relationships that you will need in your life. One, you need to build relationship with God with it, and with people who are above you. There are a lot of people we could learn from, and the number one in that place is God. You have to learn from God, learn from, you know, try to copy God, imitate God, be like God. So that's the number one. Learn from, build relationship with people who could give to you people you could learn from. Number two, build relationship with your peers, with people who are going through the same challenges, the same struggles, and people who live in your generation. Number three, build relationship with people who need you, who need the gifts and the talents that have been deposited into you by God. So you need to build relationship. That is number two thing that will really assure you of a major victory in ministry. Number three thing that you want to learn, uh, you want to live by a principle that will learn a lesson that will help you, you ask for three things. So number three thing will be, uh, uh, like I said, number one is stewardship, number two is relationship, number three is leadership. Leadership. Provide leadership to people. Make yourself available to give direction 
to other men. There are so many people in this world today, but not too many people know where they are going. And not too many people actually know where to go. So if you are a pastor, make sure you help everybody in your church to get a direction, to get a vision. Provide leadership to them. Leadership by example. Leadership by doing. Leadership by serving. Leadership by loving. You know, just show them how to do it. When you show them how to do it, and you show them the way, and you go first, by example, people will follow you, and you say, the next thing you will say, you have a large following. So three keys, stewardship, relationship, leadership. I made them all sheep so that you could remember them. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Sunday, we have also another question coming in from Hong Kong, and that is, uh, dear Pastor Sunday, you have grown your church to a size uh, that is uh, 25,000 and beyond today. Uh, could you tell us, uh, as a pastor of a small church and growing, how many uh, pastors should I groom and how many pastors do you think I need uh, or do you need uh, to to run uh, the, uh, the the entire church? Because because a senior pastor cannot cope with 25,000 alone. So what is uh, what is your criteria in appointing the pastors and how many pastors do you need for, your, for that size to run a church? Uh, and for able to every, minister. For every hundred people, you need a pastor. So if you have a hundred people, you need at least one pastor for that. If you have 200, you need two pastors. If you have 300, you need three pastors. If you have 400, you need four pastors. If you have 500, you will need five pastors. But the idea and how you take this past, and where you get these pastors from, is that you must have the philosophy that believes that everybody that comes to you is a potential pastor. So if you look at anybody, everybody that walks into your church as somebody that you need to groom to become a leader and a pastor eventually, definitely from every hundred, one will become a pastor. And there's another question also coming from Myanmar again. Uh, Dear Pastor Sande, uh, is there a risk uh, in appointing uh, a, a wrong pastor or or a bad pastor who may not be perfect and and how do I deal with it? Do I do I replace them? Have you faced this situation before? Yes. Uh, well, uh, regularly, you will always have, have the risk of uh, making mistakes, but never appoint pastors from somewhere else. Never put advertisements out for a pastor, and never uh, look to employ pastors who are ready-made pastors. What you need to do is to groom the pastors or produce the pastors from your own uh, followership, membership. So um, that way you will have less challenges in that area. But um, in case you make a mistake, what you need to do is to have an open talk with that person and let them know that you know they have not fulfilled your expectations of them and that uh, you want to encourage them to try themselves out in other areas of the ministry or in a more junior position. And um, if they are normal people, if they will be, they will appreciate the fact that you are not outrightly throwing them away or dismissing them. So they will probably agree to go and occupy a lower position. So that way, I've not really had to uh, dismiss or sack a pastor altogether. I always give them a lesser responsibility. Another question that is coming in uh, from Japan. Uh, dear Pastor Sunday, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a small church in Japan in Tokyo. Uh, if you have uh, failed to produce a church in Ukraine, do you have a plan B? If I fail? Yeah, if you have, if you have failed to have a, a, a church in Ukraine, do you have a plan B? No, I I was not planning to fail in the first place. So I never had a plan B. I only had one plan of making it happen and making it work. And it did work because I was my I, I was able to build the largest church in the country uh, within this in the in the in just four years or you know and um, maybe in three years and in the next five years I was able to build the largest church in Europe. So uh, I didn't have any plan of failing any, at all. Anything I do, I try to do it to the best of my knowledge. And I try to find out, first of all, that it was the will of God. So I know that if I do anything by the will of God, and if I do it to the best of my knowledge, 
I will always succeed. But the plan B is for people who are expecting to fail. I never expected to fail. So I, I know, no, I didn't have a plan B. Uh, uh, another question that is coming in uh, from Singapore. Uh, Dear Pastor Sandy, I read your book Shift and my curiosity has grown to, to and I want to know why do you name your book uh, Church Shift? Oh, okay. Well, we need to shift the way the, the way church is done these days. The church needs to shift worldwide. The Church uh, of America needed to shift. Well, I saw that in America. And I, I saw that going, I've been to Sim Singapore. I've been to Japan. I've been to many of those countries where they're calling from. And I've seen churches all over the world. And I could see that a lot of churches, unfortunately, are church-focused church. That is, there are churches that are mainly operating from the pulpit and in the four walls of the church. And I feel we need to shift into the society. The focus of the church is supposed to be the society. That is, the society is supposed to be, um, let me say, the society is supposed to be the auditorium while the church is just the platform. So the church, the, my church in Ukraine, I don't see myself as pastor of the Embassy of God Church. I see myself as pastor in Ukraine. But, and the embassy of God church is just a platform from where is like the stage from where I speak, I minister, I operate in the nation. So I think our focus as church worldwide is supposed to be from just focusing in, in, in house, you know, in the local church, we're supposed to focus on bringing the, the values and the, and the, and the principles of the kingdom of God from the local church to the larger society and going and penetrating it every sphere of the society with, with those values and those principles so that the larger society will it, uh, uh, reflect the image of Christ that is in the church. I have another question that's coming in from South Korea. It's a Bible school student and uh, the South Korean student said, uh, Dear Pastor Sunday, I'm inspired by uh, your teachings in your book uh, called Church Chef uh, one year ago. Uh, I'd like to know, why did you did, did, did you name your church the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God? Uh, where do you get your inspiration from? You, 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 well, I got, yes, I got that inspiration from uh, studying the message of the kingdom. And, you know, I began to discover that, hey, wait a minute, uh, God's biggest dream is that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was God's, Jesus' burden. God had a burden that his will that is in heaven will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So I discovered that that is the passion of God that things that are happening, that heaven will be reduplicated on the earth. And that's what he did with, uh, with us in Genesis chapter 1, when he's, he, cre he created man and, uh, and woman and blessed them and said they should reproduce, they should be fruitful and uh, multiply and, you know, and occupy the earth. The, and he's saying, so it means God put man in the Garden of Eden and is charging the man to spread out from that garden of Eden to fill the whole earth with the reality of the kingdom of God as it was in the garden. So I discovered that God's passion and God's greatest burden is that the reality of heaven will come to the earth. And then uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it said, I mean, verse uh, 15 to 17, I mean, from verses 17 to uh, 21, sorry, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5. He's talking about now that he has redeemed, Jesus Christ has come and has made us ambassadors that we should now go and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. So if we are supposed to be ambassadors, then it means that his church that we represent here is supposed to be his embassy. So that's where we got the inspiration from. So the church is the embassy. We are the ambassador. Now, I got a question from Thailand, and it's a Bible student uh, from Thailand right now. 
Uh, this question is uh, from a woman, and she says, Dear Pastor uh, Sunday, uh, your book Church Shift has inspired me about equipping uh, a place for world changers, and I too want to be as powerful as, as yourself. Uh, you said in your book that God is looking for people who will, be bring, who will bring powerful and spiritual solutions to our world problems. Um, could you tell me and, and, and give me an example about how uh, you have faith to raise people from the dead? I mean, uh, uh, it, it seems to be very challenging. So what, how much faith did it take you to do that? Yeah, no, I would like to say that personally, I have not raised people from the dead. We had people in our church and instances in our church when people have raised people from the dead. So, uh, but, you know, I think it's the same faith that it takes to heal somebody of headache or the same faith it takes to heal someone of cancer or the same faith it takes to heal someone from wheelchair is uh, the same faith it takes. But, you know, I have a lot of principles as well that could be taught, but and I will encourage you to go maybe to my website and, you know, listen to a lot of my messages or to go to YouTube and you see Pastor Sunday Adelaja or you go to my Facebook page, you'll be able to see a lot of my messages there. There are a lot of principles that you, you I, will be, I could share with you. In, in other words, uh, Pastor Sunday, you actually empower your people so that they can, they can believe and uh, bring healing to the, to the people outside the realm then. Exactly. So I just empower the people in the church and they go everywhere and wherever they meet any challenging situation, they face it by the things that have been taught. And uh, that helps them to, to do the impossible. Amazing. And folks, uh, pastors around the world and leaders, uh, please get hold of this wonderful book, Church Chef, which is now available on Amazon.com or at your, at your local uh, church bookstore or bookstores uh, nearby uh, your neighborhood. And if, of course, if you're waiting for a mass market paperback, it will be available next year uh, as from February in 2014. Now, let's move on uh, very quickly. You also published this wonderful book, Money Won't Make You Rich, last <laughs> Sunday. Now, yes. now uh, a lot of pastors and even laymen uh, around the world uh, and businessmen, they like to know uh, what made you write this book, Money Won't you Make You Rich. What inspired you? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I discovered that as a pastor, I was, um, you know, living from uh, pocket, from hand to mouth for a long time. That is to say, we had a lot of money coming in as a monthly budget. For example, we could have maybe $100,000 coming for a, in a, for a monthly budget or 200000 or half a million dollars. But it doesn't matter how much amount we have coming in as our budget, it always got finished before the end of the month. <laughs> so I was really wondering why this? And um, I knew that there were some things I didn't know. I also, I saw a lot of needs in my local church. I saw people uh, that, you know, come and they are not very well off materially, uh, financially. And I knew that it's not just enough to teach them to give their tithe and offering. And tithe and offering, some of them have been giving tithe and offering for 10, 20 years, and not too much has changed. And uh, I then discovered that the greatest secret of um, financial breakthrough uh, and prosperity it's not just by giving tithe and offering. That is the fundamental. Fund, fund, that is just the fundamental. But the greatest secret to you know breakthrough financially is in economic empowerment of individuals. So I discovered that I needed to learn the principles of economic empowerment, and that and just so I began to study this subject. And uh, then I also discovered that if I needed to teach people about how to make money. I needed to put it into practice myself. So what I did was that I gave myself two years to make my first million dollar uh, in US dollars. But instead of making this million dollars in two years, I made it in nine months. So I discovered that it is possible actually to become a millionaire. And it is possible for everybody who wants to, to become a millionaire. 
And especially for Christians, every Christian can become a millionaire if they really want to. And I put all the principles in this book to help people. And I was able to make it. In three years, we were able to raise 200 millionaires in US dollars. Amazing. Now, money won't make you rich. Now, what is the uh, the principle uh, and your philosophy about money today? You know, uh, do you think that Christians uh, should think that money is 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 just a printed material where you can buy what you need or is money uh, a, a principle where god give us a, an account where we're supposed to bless others you know i think money is just an instrument i think money is just a means it's not a goal money is just a sheet of paper it's just a piece of paper that needs to be used. Money for me is as good as having, it's like, just like a cup of glass, a glass of water, that, the glass that you use to drink water, or knife and, 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 uh, and um, fork and spoon that you use to eat rice. You know, it's just a tool. So as far as I'm concerned, money is just an ordinary tool. It's as, as simple as a tool like the bed that you sleep with or the shoes that you wear or the clothes that you put on. It's just a, an instrument that you use to accomplish your goals. I believe that everybody has got a goal and a purpose and a mission that God created him or her for, and God sent everybody down here for a purpose. So, and uh, for you to fulfill that purpose on the earth, the earth demands some currencies. You need some means, some tools to get there. And that's what money is needed for. Money is supposed to be gained and conquered by Christians so that they could now use it to, to, to apply to fulfilling their uh, purposes and goals in life. Now, the title, Money Won't Make You Rich, we have a question uh, coming in uh, from Seoul Korea. Uh, he's a businessman and he says, uh, Dear Pastor, uh, I've read your book, Money Won't Make You Rich, God's Principles for True Wealth, Prosperity and Success. Now, uh, I'm a rich man. But I don't feel rich. When I saw your title, I realized that that all the money that I made doesn't make me rich. Could you explain to me how then how does money make me rich? How does money make you you rich, or how does money doesn't make you rich? Uh, he wants to know, uh, the the South Korean uh, businessman wants to know how can money uh, make him feel more fulfilling. Oh, well, money will never make you rich. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Money doesn't make you rich. That's what I'm saying. You've got to be rich before you go. You get money. Or if you have money already, wealth, money, and uh, but you still need to be rich anyway. For you to be truly rich, you must find out God's calling for your life. You must find out God's purpose. God's mission, why he sent you here to the world. And now when you've discovered that mission, let's say the mission is to bring, to uh, f- no, to eradicate poverty or to feed hungry people. Let's say feed a thousand hungry people in a day. If that's you, you have discovered that that's your calling, uh, you, you now direct money towards that direction. So your true wealth now becomes your mission the discovery of yourself it is then you become rich you become rich inside because before you become rich outside the outward wealth or riches does not make you rich inside but if you become rich inside first then you will be wealthy outside and the wealth outside will benefit you that's what god was saying when he says that it is only god's blessings that enriches and adds no sorrow to it so if you're already enriched by god by god's mission by god's purpose you have you are already addicted to fulfilling god's will fulfilling god's purpose that's what jesus said when he says seek ye for the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then all other things will make sense so all of that things will not make sense until you have become rich with a passion to advance the kingdom of God. So if, when you have, when you are already at, you know, fulfilled, I mean, filled up with the passion to advance the kingdom of God, then the riches outside will make sense and make you uh, happy. 
I have a question uh, from Hong Kong. A businessman has uh, has a question for you, uh, Pastor Sunday. Uh, dear Pastor Sunday, uh, I read your book, Money Won't Make You Rich. How can I teach my son uh, the principles uh, about money? And, and what's, what kind of criteria do you uh, teach to others, especially your own children, about money? How can they too experience the way I experience? I teach my children that they are here for a purpose. And my children are 15, uh, 13, and, um, and 10. So I teach them that even now, at the tender age of 10 and 12 and 15, that they must begin to think of how to resolve world's questions and challenges that they should take upon themselves the challenge of resolving world's problems, that we are here as an instrument to solve somebody's problems. It is because some, I see you now, Robin, wearing glasses. It is because somebody resolved that issue of eyesight. That's why you can wear glasses. I see you wear, wearing earphone. It is because somebody resolved that question. That's why you, you, are, uh, you are using earphone. I see you using computer looking at me while I'm in Ukraine and you are in Singapore. It is because somebody resolved that problem. There are challenges in the world. We are all created to resolve a problem. You know, you know, so, you know uh, Abraham was created to become the father of nations. Sarah was created to become the mother of nations. Uh, Enoch was created to show us how to work with God. Uh, Adam, uh, Adam was created to be the father of men. Uh, Jesus was sent to the world to become the deliverer and the savior of the earth. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the, the Israelis. My eyes are created to see to solve a problem. My hands are created to, to handle and to touch. My mouth is created to, to speak. My nose is created to sniff and to, to sense. My mouth is created to eat. My feet is supposed to, to, to walk. So all my children, I teach them that you are a solution to some problems in the world. And money is just a tool that you could get to resolve some of those things. I have a question also coming in from Tokyo, for Japan itself, and that is, uh, dear uh, Pastor Sunday, you spoke about the three laws of making uh, your money work. Uh, I have failed uh, to to see that happen because the, the bank's interest today do not give me a very attractive return. Uh, there, uh, what are the three laws uh, that you adopt, and what sort of criteria criteria do you uh, you know do you make uh, your money work? Number one, number one, the, the first law of money you must be uh, cognitive of, and I cannot talk enough, I will just give you the points here, is that money must not be spent. That, is, that's, that sounds very obscure, and that sounds very paradoxical, isn't it? Money is not to be spent. You must know that. That is the first law of money. Or I, we could call it in a different way, Money must be retained. Number two, money must not control you. You must not obey money. You must not obey the command of money. Money must not be your Lord. You must not listen to the commands of money. That's number two. Number three, Money must be put to work. Three things. Money must not be spent or money must be retained. Number two, money must not be obeyed. Or you must not listen to the commands of money. Number three, money must be invested. Amazing. Uh, last two questions. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll just we just have. Oh, uh, sorry, viewers, but we have we can only take in two more questions because I know that uh, Pastor Sunday has a schedule to catch. Uh, Pastor Sunday, two more questions. One is uh, that's coming in from Singapore. Dear Pastor Sunday, is money evil? You know, because the Bible spoke about money and it says you no, know, the root of the for the love of money is is evil. Is that true? And how can we ad uh, adopt uh, what kind of a principle must we adopt then to resolve this? And, and number two, uh, what is uh, the what how what is uh, financial freedom? Uh, and how can how can I be as free as 
anyone else. Uh, in other words, uh, financial freedom in terms of how we, you spoke about uh, making money, putting money to work. So, so uh, could you elaborate uh, just one or two pointers on this? Okay. So number one question, can you say it again? Uh, the, the first question is, uh, is money is seen as the root of all evil, uh, the Bible says. So how can we uh, perceive money differently? You know, is money really evil? Okay. Number one, um, the, it's not really accurate that the Bible says money is the root of all evil. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Loving money is what makes money the root of all evil, not money itself. So money is neutral. <laughs> but when you begin to fall in love with money, then you worship money. Whatever you love, you worship. But we are called to love God and worship God, serve God. So if you love God, serve God, worship God, follow God, I only use money as a tool, <laughs> as a tool to please God, to please God. Mm -hmm. Money is only a tool to serve God better, to please God better, never fall in love with money, love God, then money will not be evil for you. Well, and the second question, uh, the second question was, you know, um, how how do how do how do I understand uh, about making uh, money? How do I understand uh, in uh, making the money making money the right way? Oh, making money the right way. Number one, uh, you must learn the principles of diligence. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter four, verse, I mean chapter ten, verse four, that the hands of the lazy bring leads to poverty. Hands of laziness, lazy, leads him to poverty. But the hands of the diligent leads to wealth and riches. So diligence leads to wealth. So we must learn to work diligently. We must learn to be diligent in everything we do. It also say if you find it diligent in his work, it will not stand before ordinary men. It will stand before great men. Diligence, diligence is one way of making money the right way. Number two, in the book of Genesis, chapter one, verse fifteen, when God had taken Adam to the Garden of Eden, God gave him an instruction. He says. To, for him to till the ground and keep it. He gave him an instruction, till the ground, that is cultivate the ground, work on the ground, develop the ground, and after doing that, keep it, service it, protect it, wash away. So that tells us something. For me to really make money the right way, I must learn the laws of cultivation. I must be able to cultivate myself first because the first ground, the first land that I must cultivate is myself. I am my biggest resource. I must cultivate my giftings. I must cultivate my talents. I must cultivate my skills. I must cultivate my brain. I must cultivate my strength. I must cultivate my mind. I must cultivate everything that God has given to me. So if I develop everything God has given to me, if I cultivate everything God has given to me, then I can produce better products, quality products, and valuable products. The level of your cultivation determines your value. The level of your cultivation of yourself or the level of your working on yourself, of developing yourself, determines your value. So some people are ready to pay uh, $1 for a shirt, 
But for some other shirts, some people will be ready to pay $1,000 for it. Why? Because of the amount of value that has been added. So the way to make the best uh, money, uh, uh, the right way, is to be diligent, is to add values. Add values to things. The more values you add to yourself and to the things you do, the more wealthy you become. Also, go and resolve problems. Resolve problems. Mm -hmm. And when you resolve problems, resolve it in a way that is in, in a in a that is that is diligent, with quality, with uh do to the best of your knowledge, then you will always be in demand. There's a question from China, Pastor Sunday, and that is, uh, Dear Pastor Sunday, I read your book, uh, What Money Won't, Won't Make You Rich, about three months ago. And my question is this. I, I, am, a, I am now 69 years old. I'm a businessman. I only make, uh, well, for the last uh, uh, four years of my life, about approximately about $100,000 per year. I run a small business. And do you think uh, God has recognized my value uh, and my capacity of the amount of money that I make, you know, does God really care uh, about how much money do I make or how much I've already given back to the, to the society uh, in in the passion that I do? What is your measurement of 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 a person who is rich? The measurement is how much you are able to uh, make an impact, how much value you are able to add to the society, and how much value you are able to add to people around you. You might not even make a hundred thousand a year. Maybe you're making ten thousand a year or twelve thousand a year, but you might have more impact than somebody who is making ten million a year. So it all depends on the impact you are making. It all depends on the difference you are making. Jesus said. Uh, I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was in the hospital and you didn't visit me. I was in prison and you didn't come to see me. So the impact that you make and the value that you add is what actually signifies your your that that, that, that your, your significance in this kingdom. So in the kingdom of God, it is your impact that matters. It is not how much you make. It is how much stewardship you have given to others. Mm. I have a, a question from Singapore. A senior pastor would like to ask this uh, to you. Uh, dear Pastor uh, Sunday, I am very, uh, you know, very well fed uh, in Singapore and I'm doing very well uh, serving in one of the largest churches uh, in Singapore today. Uh, could you give me some examples? If you, have you ever experienced uh, any financial failure in your life and 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 how can can I overcome and learn from you? Are there three key three key things that you have learned from failure, financial failures? Um, I've not. Uh, I don't think I have too many lessons in this. But a lot of people in my church have a lot of lessons in this. Like I said, we I I, I helped about two hundred people to become a millionaire in U.S. dollars uh, in three years. But soon after that, in 2008, we had the crisis, the worldwide crisis, the economic crisis, and it affected a lot of uh, people. And these people, a lot of these people, uh, they couldn't sell their properties. They had land, they had buildings they had that were frozen and the prices went down and a lot of them went to bankruptcy. And so a lot of financial challenges and it actually landed me and our church in a lot of financial uh, problems because people were accusing the, me and the church as being responsible for this. But it's a worldwide financial crisis anyway. Anyway, so I, I think I have some experience, but not as good because I've not personally experienced too many financial fiasco, but at least I have experience talking and working with people who have gone through a lot of financial challenges. And also, uh, before we end, uh, what is your philosophy of prosperity uh, today? What is what is your philosophy of, of prosperity? How? I don't think I understand the question to uh, the end. Uh, the the uh, what is your philosophy? What's your uh, what is the uh, for prosperity? Uh, what is what is what is your your philosophy? Do you is is prosperity good? Uh, 
in terms of uh, in terms of talent, uh, balancing with wealth, or or is it got to do how much impact that uh, that will that will give us a, a fuller uh, self uh, consciousness of of prosperity? In other words, is it do, must we balance? But uh, does prosperity measured by how much we impact? The world. Yeah. Um, at, at, at the same time, how much money that we make? Well, I don't necessarily believe too much in the gospel of prosperity, in the prosperity gospel, the way people talk about it. I don't think that is a doctrine. I don't think it has to be taken to become such a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal. I think there are many things that are much more important. I see money and prosperity just as a tool. I think that, uh, you know, God wants everybody to be well off and God wants everybody's needs to be met. But I don't think prosperity is something that we should chase after. I don't think prosperity is something that we should live for. I think prosperity is needed only for people who want to make a difference in the world and people who want to make the world a better place. And so if you want to make a better place, the world a better place, if you want to impact your world and make your world a better place, you might need to consider prosperity and a lot of wealth. But if you are doing well and you are making an impact and you think what you are having is enough, I don't think you need to you know, be overly anxious about prosperity. Well, Pastor, I, I have just one very last question that's coming in. Uh, so viewers, please take note. This will be the very last question for Pastor Sunday. Um, uh, this this question is coming in uh, from uh, from Australia. Uh, dear Pastor Sunday, uh, I've read uh, your book, uh, Money Won't Make You Rich, as well as uh, Church Shift. I'm a, I'm a senior pastor in one of the churches uh, serving in Melbourne. And... My question is this: How do you measure uh, transparency? How do you uh, how do you do you ensure uh, good le leadership as well as managing of uh, of of funds, and at the same time uh, not uh, led astray? Well, uh, I think there are two words for this: is uh, submission and accountability. I think that any leader needs to be submitted to another leader. So myself, I have somebody that I'm uh, submitted to. And uh, also accountability in this financial sense, it, it means that you don't take all the decisions. You are just one of the people that take the decisions, but you have other people uh, around you that are responsible for other things. Like, for example, in our church, I'm not responsible for money matters at all. I don't have anything to do with money. I don't touch money. I teach about money, I, but money are always being handled by other people. So I think that might be a way to uh, safeguard yourself from uh, corruption. Well, once again, uh, Pastor Sunday, thank you so much for joining us here at the National Quiz Choice. And uh, viewers, uh, I want to thank uh, the Charisma House. Uh, this program is sponsored by Charisma House and Charisma Media. Uh, publishing and also please take note uh, don't forget to get hold of pastor sunday's uh, book money won't make you rich is uh, as well as church chef uh it's now available on amazon.com and also at all leading good bookstores and even at your church as well and once again thank you for joining me and pastor sunday uh, before we go can we just uh can i just pray for you uh, uh just for one moment yes please uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, Pastor Sunday uh, and his ministry. I pray that, Lord, you will continue to grow his ministry uh, in Ukraine. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will sweep uh, this nation and this nation will make an impact to all other nations uh, around them so that no one will ever uh, understand but stand in awe. I pray that you will cover him with the precious blood and protect him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Amen. Well, and just one last question for you, Pastor Sunday. Uh, what's next for you? Are you planning to write a new book? Oh, yes. I have I have written about 
130 books in Russian, in Russian language, uh, because this area of the world speak Russian, and my congregation are mainly Russian speaking, and I've written about 30 books in English. So I plan to, I have a plan to write a thousand books before I leave this earth. Oh, so what will be your next uh, new title next year? Um, I, th I was thinking about writing on the topic of uh, uh, the kingdom driven life. Very similar to Rick Warren's king, uh, purpose driven life, but this will be kingdom driven life. Okay, could you share with me just uh, any mark, uh, market changes uh, over in Ukraine uh, so that the people around uh, the world can pray for you and even explore uh, any opportunities? What's happening in Ukraine right now? What do you see the future of Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine is um, a country that is undergoing um, <laughs> a transformation from communism to capitalism to free market, and it's not easy because we have uh, influences from Russia, and Russia is fighting for Ukraine not to go to the European Union. So Ukraine is uh, between the Europe, your Western European Union, European Union and Russia. So that is one political challenge that we're having. So people like me, who is a foreigner and who is bringing Protestant values, are regarded as, as intruders. So right now, I'm being sued and challenged by the government. I'm, I'm in court right now, uh, being sued for fraud and for uh, being accused falsely of things that happened during the financial economic meltdown in the, of 2008 because of what happened to some of the businesses that our members started. So just being the, because I'm the pastor of the church, I'm being saying, oh, you should be responsible because you teach these people how, how to make money. So that's uh, one thing you could pray for. But besides that, in the church sense, we are experiencing a major revival. The church here is growing. We have uh, a tremendous movement of God. You can, you, I, I would advise everyone that is interested in what God is doing in Ukraine to just go to uh, Pastor Sunday Adelaja on Facebook or uh, you know, the internet. And you can follow, uh, you know, what God is doing, or Pastor Sunday, uh, or Pro or just Sunday Adelaide on the on Twitter, and you will see a lot of the movement of God. For example, in November, I'm going to have people coming from about 25 countries, uh, maybe 40 countries, to come for for a week in Ukraine to undergo training, believers and pastors training. So people come twice a year to Ukraine from different countries of the world to go through training on how to bring about national transformation of their countries. This happens in November and April every year, the first week of November and the first week of April. What would be the three key advice for any foreigner or businessman uh, who wants to come to Ukraine for the very first time? Uh, I know that you have some experience uh, for some time in Ukraine right now. Is there any three key, exper uh, three key advice uh, for anyone who wants to start a ministry or a business in Ukraine? Should they contact you? Yes. Number one, if you want to come to Ukraine, you could just write, uh, you want to come to Ukraine for either for business or for ministry, get in touch with me. I pledge to get back in touch with you. Just write to pastor at godembassy.org or guest at God Embassy. God Embassy is one word. It's not God's Embassy, just GodEmbassy.org. And I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. So uh, that's number one. Get in touch with someone you know in Ukraine. And you know Pastor Sunday already. You know the Embassy of God Church. Or go to our website, and uh, then we'll be able to help you. Number two, second advice is most people in Ukraine don't speak English. So if you want to come to start a ministry or just to visit in Ukraine, you must uh, make sure that you have somebody on the ground to provide you with a translator or an interpreter. That's number two thing you, you want to know. Number three things you will not want to know is that you will need to begin to process your visa. To visit here, you need a visa. And for you to come, you need to begin to process your visa at least a month before so you might need a letter of invitation as well so if you write a letter of invitation to us if you write to us we could provide that for you as well 
Well, once again, thank you, uh, Pastor Sunday, and thank you, viewers, for watching the National Quiz Choice. I'm Robin Steinberg. Have a good week ahead, and please don't forget to get hold of Pastor Sunday's uh, book, uh, Money Won't Make You Rich, as well as uh, uh, The Church Chef, now available at all leading good bookstores on Amazon.com and also your, at your church bookstore as well. This program is sponsored by Charisma Media and Charisma House. And, and once again, thank you for watching. I'm Robin Steinberg. Bye.